In our last episode, I showed you how we fabricate and install these handsome custom front doors on our buses. And now that my bus is the proud owner of one of those doors, it means for the first time since we started this project, I'm totally sealed in and protected from the elements. Just like on a regular house, from here forward, we can start on the interior build. And for us, that means starting by installing our insulated subfloor. We do things a little bit differently around here, and that's why I made this video to share with you some of our tips and tricks and maybe more controversial building methods and products so that if you follow our lead, you'll end up with something that is not only going to be insulated and solid, but might save you a few steps and a few bucks along the way. Thanks for tuning in for this edition of the Schoolie Conversion Guide. Let's get started. With the old bus subfloor a distant memory, I wanted to take a second and talk about the products we're going to be using as we start to rebuild this bus from the ground up. And the first place to start, if we may, is actually by going back a little bit. And I want to talk about what I like to use when it's time to clean up that rusty metal floor pan. I see a lot of folks getting in there with the wire brushes and that is fine, but will take you forever. And then I see a lot of other people going with the uh, wire wheels for their angle grinders. And that looks like a great choice, but um, one thing you have to be careful with is not all wire wheels are the same. This wire wheel here is actually called a braided wire wheel. And that is a very important distinction because if you think of a um, normal wire wheel, you have the center hub and then you have just wires coming out of it radially. And that's really good for light rust removal. Um, but my big beef with that is because the wires are just kind of like whiskers floating in space, when you're using it, they go flying and they'll end up in your pant legs, in your skin, worst case, in your eye. And they also don't really stand up to the task of removing really deep embedded uh, rust and grime. So we like to use what are called braided wire wheels, and I'll give you a close up on this. But it's the same style of wire wheel. Um, but then what they do is they take all of those wires coming off and they braid them or twist them together. And it makes a, a wire wheel that is much more durable. And it will actually, instead of just losing and flinging the wires off, it actually just wears down. And you get something that can do a lot more work for you. In my opinion, it's a lot safer and it lasts a lot longer. So backtracking a bit, but this is definitely the way to go when it's time to get in there and brush all of the rust and grime off of your metal floor pan. Moving away from that, um, I wanna talk about what you do after you have all of that rust gone. Um, one of the products I really like to use uh, is this uh, concrete and metal prep. Um, this is a clean strip, but I'll tell you what it really is. It's just phosphoric acid. And I know that sounds scary, but phosphoric acid is actually an ingredient in Coca-Cola. Nuts, right? What this does is it gets in there and it converts uh, iron oxide, which is rust, into a paintable surface. If you don't do something like this, and depending on the paint you use, you're not going to get good adhesion. And so as soon as that area gets wet again, the rust will just pick up basically right where it left off. So that's a bummer. We like to use this, especially if you're going to be using a product like this um, Rust-Oleum rusty metal primer to uh, cover your floor pan. However, after a few years of using these two things in tandem, I discovered one of my favorite products, and that is a product called Chassis Saver. And you'll have to forgive me because I spilled paint <laughs> on the front of this, but this is a really incredible paint. It's not cheap, it's about $110 a gallon. One gallon is more than enough to do the floor pan on an entire 40 foot bus. And this stuff is incredible. It cures rock hard. It seals in the metal in a way that none of this cute like Rust-Oleum stuff that you get at Home Depot can. It's really intense. It's an industrial product. It's heavy duty. If you get it on your skin, the only way to remove it is time. <laughs> and that's like your skin needs to like shed. But I love it. Um, I discovered this first when we were doing a restoration on a vintage Crown bus and we were trying to preserve the original frame as best as possible. It didn't really have any rust on it. 
and we wanted to keep it that way. And so I was looking into options that were a little more advanced and professional than your typical Rust-Oleum. And this is what I found. It had great reviews and we've been using this for the past five years and I can't say enough good things about it. What's different about this versus your Home Depot, you know, $30 a gallon is that it wants to bond directly to a rusty surface. It needs something to like bite into. So if you hit it with something like this prep and etch product here, it's actually going to prohibit the chassis saver from bonding as, as well as it potentially could. So that's something to be on the lookout for. But the nice thing is if you use this product, you can skip the step here of using the phosphoric acid. After you abrade the surface and get the flaky rust off, you can go straight to the chassis saver, which is what I'm doing on my bus. Uh, and you'll see in a second and you get great results. You get to skip a step and you don't have to use the phosphoric acid, which if you ever mess with this stuff, it's not super dangerous, but it smells awful. It turns your bus into something that smells like a big pile of like gym socks. I don't like it. I got some chassis saver on my hands here, so I'm going to wipe that off. Um, wow. Let's see. I wore gloves even before. Anyway. <laughs> So the chassis saver is great stuff. Once you have the floor painted with the product of your choice, of course, recommending the chassis saver, it's time to think about what your floor stack is going to look like. And for us, we like to use rigid foam board insulation topped with a high quality OSB subfloor. And this is going to be the start of a pretty big soapbox moment. So if you need to go make popcorn, get ready, grab a drink. Go ahead, make yourselves comfortable. It's a semi-controversial opinion of mine, but a lot of people get really obsessed with plugging all of the holes in their metal floor pan. I get it. It seems like the right thing to do and it feels good to do it. So why not, you know? Well, I've got a story and then some products that hopefully will convince you that that's something you don't need to worry about. Um, in my old bus that I lived in one day, I had a situation where the water inlet hose going into my bus had come loose and it flooded the interior of my bus with many gallons of water. During the build out of my bus, I had opted not to either weld up or otherwise seal all of the seat holes in my floor pan. Um, I did that for a couple of reasons, but the biggest one was being lazy and, and believing that it didn't really matter. It's underneath the bus. So I was very pleased when all of the water that was leaking into my bus was able to find a way out of the floor because I'd left those holes uncovered. Um, if I hadn't, essentially I would have turned my bus into a giant bathtub and the whole, you know, subfloor would have just filled with water. That's reason number one. The next reason is, a lot of folks will go in and they'll try to weld them shut. Um, one time I was welding the, the holes in a floor pan shut. And while I was doing that, a hot piece of slag from the hole fell through the floor and landed on one of the suspension airbags on the bus and it burned a hole through it. So because of that, I got to spend about 200 bucks. This is on a client's bus. I got to spend about 200 bucks and a few hours of an afternoon replacing one of the airbags on the suspension because of that hot slag burning a hole through. The other drawback to welding the hole shut is that when you do that, it looks great on top and you might paint it and do all that, but unless you go underneath, anywhere that you've welded, not only do you have the weld, which is just new bare steel, but you probably burned off all of the undercoating around that. So you need to go underneath and apply some type of undercoating or paint. Otherwise, you've just introduced maybe 80 places where you can now get rust on bare steel. The last thing to all of this is that if you do decide to insulate the floor of your bus, and I would encourage everyone to do that, if you use an insulation like this here, this is designed to be buried, submerged in dirt and mud and will not degrade. So as a part of our flooring system, we leave those holes because we're not worried about them since the next layer down is going to be foam board. 
to varying degrees of thickness and gluing that form foam board down will be our polyurethane adhesive. So you have two things that are totally, totally impervious and don't care about water, uh, sealing that all up. So in my opinion, plugging in the holes is a big waste of time, but it makes people feel good. That's not a good enough reason though for me to do it. So anyways, moving on, we're not gonna weld or plug the holes, we're gonna leave them. And what comes next is our foam board insulation. Um, the next probably you know, controversial thing that we do around here is we do not frame our subfloors. And what I mean by that is we do not lay you know, two by four sleeper joists or two by two sleeper joists down the floor and frame it out, put insulation in that, and then screw our subfloor to that. We instead go directly from the metal floor pan to our foam board insulation to our OSB subfloor. We do that because it's totally unnecessary, but also because if you do decide to put in those sleeper joists, it creates a thermal bridge. Wood has an R value of about one per inch. This has an R value of about five per inch. So every place that you have a piece of wood in your floor that's touching the uninsulated metal floor pan and then your plywood subfloor, you have a thermal conductor that is five times more efficient than the foam in there. I made this mistake again on my, it wasn't my first bus, but on the bus that I lived in for five years. And I could actually go in with my laser thermometer and I could see where the sleeper joists were because in the winter time, those portions of the floor were significantly colder. Now the foam that we use is called extruded polystyrene foam which is different than expanded polystyrene, and that's an important difference. Expanded polystyrene is the little white foam balls that you'll see coolers made out of and things like that, and also insulation. Extruded polystyrene is a totally different animal. This has not only a better R value per inch, but it's also much denser and has a higher compression, uh, compressive strength. So we like to use Fomular, which is an Owens Corning product, Fomular 250. Uh, the 250 means that it has a 25 PSI compression rating. Um, you can get it in the 150 and it goes all the way up to 1,000, 1,000 being 100 PSI. Now, a lot of people say, well, if you don't frame the floor, you know, going down the road, won't all the weight on top cause the foam to compact and, and you know, won't you have uh, low dip spot dips and things like that in your floor? That's just not true. Um, this stuff is incredibly strong. It's designed to be installed under concrete slabs. So it's very, very tough. And, you know, we've been doing it this way now for, I mean, the only bus we framed was mine and that was my bad. So we've been doing it this way for almost eight years now. We've had no dips and low spots and no issues. I'm a huge fan of doing it this way. You eliminate the thermal bridging, you save an entire step of framing out the floor, and you save money on materials. Um, this product is fantastic. It can be hard to find. A lot of times, you know, for me, if I'm uh, designing a bus for somebody and they're gonna live in it full time, especially in cold climates, I say you want four inches. So this is a four inch thick piece here. Um, the hard part is lately, because of you know, the way the world is, finding this has become very difficult. So they do make it in other sizes. We've got one inch here and we've got two inch here. And because I want four inches in my bus, I'm actually going to be doing two layers of two inch glued together. Um, it's a little bit of a pain in the butt, but I literally cannot find this stuff in four inches anywhere. This is just a, a piece I had laying around. So that's the board that you wanna use. There's another foam board product on the market that does have a higher R value per inch than this. So this has an R value of five per inch. There is a product out there called polyiso or polyiso cyanurate board, which is oftentimes used in roofing. It has an R value as high as seven per inch, but there is a trick to that because that R value, and this is the only insulation I'm aware of that does that, it actually goes down as the temperature decreases. And it goes down so much that by the time you get to the point where the insulation in your floor is really gonna matter, it is at an R value that is actually lower than what this has. So it starts at seven, but I think by around 30 or 35 degrees, it's already below an R value of five per inch, which is what this has. So if you're doing your floor, don't use the poly ISO. 
I know it's available and tempting, but stick with the XPS. It really is the best product for that purpose. So how do we make this floor stack, you know? Well, we glue it all down and we use Loctite PL. Um, this is just like their typical, it says 3X, but it's always said 3X. I don't know three times what, but this is what we use. We buy it in the big tubes. We use one tube per four by eight sheet per layer. So we'll do one tube between the metal pan and the foam, and then one tube between the foam and the plywood. Or in my case, because I'm doing two layers of foam, it'll be a tube between the metal and the foam, a tube between the foam and the foam, and a tube between the foam and the plywood, or the OSB in my case. We use this over something like liquid nails because in my experience, this holds better, but it also cures a lot quicker. If you look at, you know, the original liquid nails, it has a cure time of like two weeks, which is just not going to fly for us. So what we'll do is we'll cut, we'll pre-cut the piece, we'll glue down the foam and the plywood, and then we'll bag it. So we'll put down a bunch of sandbags on top. And we like to use about eight sandbags per four by eight foot sheet that we install. The top layer of this flooring assembly, and this is another one that might be controversial, is going to be this. And this is Advantech OSB uh, engineered subfloor. And I know a lot of people think that OSB is garbage and I'm with them, but if you've ever been around this Advantech product, you'd know that this is nothing like normal OSB. It's significantly denser. I believe this stuff is around 80 pounds a sheet where normal three quarter inch tongue and groove OSB is gonna be around 60 pounds a sheet. The strands are packed tighter, it looks different. I mean, if you look at the edge, and I'll show you a, a close up here, the edge, it just looks, you can, it's very obvious that this has more wood in it. It's engineered to be a subfloor product. It's incredibly strong. I mean, this is an off cut and it just does not flex nearly as much as OSB does. And we've started using this after years of using conventional plywood subfloor. Um, the plywood subfloor that we would get, you know, it is better than OSB, but my beef with it is that it would be cupped or bowed and the plywood that was used, the wood that was used in the plywood was oftentimes like a pine type wood that was really low density. And it would have lots of voids in the laminations of the ply. Those voids mean weakness at worst when they're buried, but when there's a void in the ply because of a knot hole or something, and that's your top layer, well, if you're using a thin finished floor, a lot of times, like a vinyl floor or some of these roll floors, that void will telegraph through and you'll actually see a little divot in the finished floor. And that's totally not acceptable, especially around here. So I started looking into alternatives and this is what I found um, after talking with people who actually do fine home building. Nobody is really using plywood for subfloors anymore because this product is so superior. And I know some of you are probably thinking, yeah, but what if it gets wet? Well, uh, anecdotally, I use this in an addition on my house and I've had a pile of scrap wood in my backyard for the past year. And some of it included this Advantech um, subfloor material. Well, after a year, this includes going through winter, being totally covered in snow and freezing and thawing and all of that. It still looks the same. It has not done the thing that typical OSB does where it expands. I'm sold. It's a superior product. It's every sheet is totally flat and uniform. It has super high density, which not only is good for holding fasteners and staying flat, it's very good for giving you that solid feel underfoot as you walk across it. So everyone's got an opinion, but in my opinion, there is no better subfloor material out there that's made of wood than this Advantech product. It is expensive. It's right now about a hundred dollars a sheet. Um, but you know, this is the foundation of your bus build. So it's a bad place to cheap out. Anyway, <laughs> I hope you're all still with me. The goal of this was to show you some of the products that I'll be using in the rest of this video, because I want you to know why we've chosen this and save you the hassle. It's taken me years to find these products and determine that this is the optimum way to construct a subfloor in a schoolie. 
but I really stand by this method and I know some of it's controversial, but until I run into somebody who has more experience and who has done something a different way with better results, I'm going to say that this is just the best way to do it. So just to recap, we start with our wire brush floor. If we're using the cheap Rust-Oleum primer, which I don't necessarily recommend, you want to treat it with phosphoric acid first. If not, go with the chassis saver. You can go straight from your um, brushed rust to this. Once the chassis saver is dried, you want to grab your Loctite PL foam board, Formular uh, 250 XPS extruded polystyrene in the thickness of your choice. Use your PL to glue down the foam board and your PL to glue down your tongue and groove Advantech three quarter inch plywood subfloor or OSB subfloor on top of the foam. You put down your sandbags, let that cure. I like to let it cure for about a day and then move on to the next course. So the next four by eight or the next two four by eight sheets. Once you're all done, I highly, highly recommend, even though this, this uh, OSB is very strong and durable and resistant to moisture, um, grab a cheap exterior paint or primer and just go ahead and paint, throw down some paint on the top of that subfloor. It's gonna not only protect it, but you have to keep in mind that because the bottom of this uh, subfloor is getting glued to the foam, we're essentially making that airtight. So as the humidity and the environment that you're in changes, it's going to cause that wood, which is always living and breathing, even when, even when it is OSB, it can cause that wood to expand and contract in ways that might lead to cupping. And we want to avoid that. We're trying to get a nice flat floor. So that's a, a quick overview of what you're about to see coming up in the video. Um, next step, we're going to take our chassis saver. We're going to go paint the floor of that bus. And then as soon as that do that's done, we can get started actually building on the inside for the first time. And that's a huge milestone in any point in the build. So let's go paint this floor. Well, it's been a day, well, a night, and the chassis saver is dried and I love the way it turned out. I'll bring you in here and give you a peek at how good this is looking. Don't mind the footprints, but we got great penetration. The coat just soaked right in everywhere. And uh, I know you might be concerned about seeing all this gloss if the glue, the PL is gonna stick to it, but we've done some tests and uh, that stuff sticks phenomenally well to this chassis saver. I'm not really sure why, because it doesn't make sense, but we're gonna go ahead and get started putting in the subfloor. Since we're using two layers of this two inch foam board insulation for our subfloor, that means we're gonna have a step up right here and at the front, four inches. And the way I like to finish that off is by taking a piece of three quarter inch plywood, which I have here, and I went ahead and cut that to our four inch height. And that's going to set right there. I'm going to use self-tapping screws to attach it here and then on this side as well. And that gives us a really good place for our foam board to butt up against. And I don't know if you can see this, but it matches up totally flush. And so then when the plywood, our Advantech OSB subfloor, goes down top of that, we'll be able to screw it right into here. So on this edge and the leading edge, it has a nice solid bite and good adhesion. And we're not just relying on the glue to hold that edge in place. Now, for whenever there's a time where I'm attaching wood to metal, there's one screw that I really love using, and it comes in two different sizes. And that are these Tex brand wood to metal self-tapping screws. They have a countersunk head, and um, they're awesome. I've seen people struggle with the wrong fasteners. Um, there is a, another brand of these that you can get at Lowe's, and I forget, it's like a green box. 
They're garbage. I don't know why they're so different. They look the same, but they're awful. These are far and away the best. And uh, well, we buy them. The inch and 7 16 size is great for attaching three quarter inch material to pretty much anything on the bus. And then if you're going to be attaching thicker material, say like inch and a half stock, um, or well, that's pretty much it really. <laughs> Um, they do have a, I think it's a two and three quarter inch long screw, um, which is good. We don't use nearly as many as those, but these are awesome. They go in easy and they hold really, really well. These guys right here. Now that we've got our threshold securely in place, we're gonna go ahead and pre-cut our pieces of foam and plywood for this course. Now, depending on your bus and whether or not it has rear wheel wells uh, and how far back it is from the back wall to those rear wheel wells, you're gonna to wanna to be strategic about how you cut these pieces. Since I have three layers, my first foam layer, my second foam layer, and then the plywood on top, I'm going to be doing everything I can to actually stagger these cuts so that I don't have just a big stack of seams there. I'm trying to keep this floor as flat as possible, which is hard to do because the floor isn't flat to start with. So my first sheet of foam is going to be a full four feet wide. My next sheet of foam, I think I'm going to go ahead and just rip in half so that I have a nice half stagger there. And then my first sheet of plywood, I think I'm gonna go ahead and have be maybe just shy of a full four feet. So maybe, you know, three feet, nine or eight inches, something like that. But what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna measure the full distance to make sure that whatever I do down here doesn't leave me with a really odd or tiny sliver up front. So let's do that. Now on this bus, because it's a conventional style bus and I've got this cockpit area, I don't have enough distance under my gas and brake pedal to actually run the full four inches of insulation from the back wall all the way up to the doghouse cover. So what I'm going to do instead is right here, immediately to the rear of the front stairwell is where I'm gonna have my step up. And so what I'll do is from here back, so this whole driver area back, that will be four inches while everything from here forward is only going to get one inch of foam insulation. It's the best I can do without opening up a can of worms and relocating brake pedals and gas pedals and, you know, really getting creative and kind of insane, frankly, with how I deal with the doghouse cover opening. Also, if I were to do the four inches all the way to the front, that would take four inches away of engine access here. And having worked on these engines in a bus like this before, I can tell you that you want to have as much access to this as possible. So I'm gonna do everything I can to actually preserve access to the engine right here. So let's go ahead and take a measurement and we will pull from our back threshold there all the way up to here. So I've got 19 feet, one inch. So because these sheets are four feet wide, I'm gonna be using five of them to get to my uh, 19 feet and one inch, and I've got about 11 inches to play with. So what I'm gonna go ahead and do is cut, let's say eight inches off of that first plywood sheet, which means that when I get to the front here, it'll be long by just a couple of inches. Let's see, by about three inches. And I'll be able to have that to work with to cut off up here. So that looks pretty good. Maybe we'll cut seven inches off the back just to be extra safe. So now we have a rough idea of what the widths, or I guess lengths, I don't know how we're talking about this, but I'm calling it the widths of each piece should be. We need to figure out how wide the bus is so we know how long to cut them. One interesting thing about the Thomas bus, which I don't know if it's coming through in the camera or not, is the floor is not flat all the way to the wall. About an inch and a half off the wall, there's a little bump up. And so what that means is that our first layer of foam is actually going to be a little bit less wide than the second layer of foam and the subsequent layer of our plywood subfloor that goes on top of it. 
Another thing to consider is that when we go to drop these pieces in across the floor here, they've got to be narrow enough to clear the chair rails on each side. So we'll be cutting the pieces just shy of the actual width for the second and top layers that I'm cutting. And that serves another function as well, which is we actually don't want that plywood subfloor material to be physically in contact with the steel chair rails. And that's for two reasons. The first reason is that it is wood, even though it is very stable and it can um, shrink and expand as the environmental conditions change. So we want to make sure it has room to grow. The second thing is we don't want that wood touching the steel because that's going to contribute to thermal bridging, which is our number one enemy in this whole flooring system. So we're going to end up with a slight gap on each side and that's actually going to be filled by spray foam when that phase of the build comes. So I've went ahead and pulled my measurements for uh, the dimensions that these pieces need to be for our bottom layer of foam, our second layer of foam, and then our top layer of subfloor. And I'm going to go ahead and go outside and rip those pieces to size. Pro tip, when you're picking up this PL adhesive, buy it in the big tubes. These are 28 ounce tubes. Don't buy, I don't know what they are, but the regular kind of caulking gun size tubes. It'll cost you a lot more money and take a lot longer. And if you're at a place like Home Depot or whatever, and you buy it by the case, you can save a few bucks doing it that way too. So, any guitar players in the house, this is a great exercise to help build your forearm strength. We're in. So I'm just going to go around the edges and clean up where some of this glue got smeared out so that it's not in the way when we come back in tomorrow. I'm going to shoot some screws into our threshold in the back there and then I'm going to bring in a whole bunch of sandbags and put sandbags on everything that's got glue under it so it gets nice and flat. And then tomorrow I'll do I think the next two pieces and the day after that I will go ahead and do the final piece before we get into the cockpit area. <laughs> well, I think we got enough weight on here. So let's just recap what we've got going on. So we've got our first course of our foam board, our second course of two inch foam board, and then finally our Advantech oriented strand board subfloor. And yeah, I've got literally about a ton of weight on this, but you really got to use that much weight if you want this to sit flat and squeeze all of the adhesive in. And maybe I go overkill on the adhesive, but in my view, um, you can't use too much of that stuff. A um, couple things I really want to point out while I'm in here, you got to stagger your seams. If you don't stagger your seams, um, any variations in the planes of your sheet goods are going to be magnified where they meet up. 
And then when you go to lay in your finished flooring, it's gonna look like garbage. I've seen people, you know, they will install the sheets sideways and then you have places, it's like the four corners where you have four corners meeting up. That's no good at all because when you go to lay your flooring across it, you're asking your flooring to deal with that plane change where it might be crowned or dipped. So tomorrow, more of the same and we will just continue marching our way down. We got about three more days left. I wanna let this stuff sit up for at least 24 hours before I come back in and start messing with it. So we'll catch you tomorrow. Ah, uh, okay, so we're back for day number two of our subfloor installation. I went ahead and took all of the weights off of these front two sheets because we'll obviously be putting more stuff on top of them. Put them on the back and uh, I already got this sheet cut, but I'm about to cut my next sheet here of insulation, my second layer. And uh, I wanted to bring you in and show you something that I did in my layout phase that you'll want to consider because it's going to make navigating these wheel wells easier for you and it's also going to make your floor a little stronger. So let me bring you in and show you what's going on. So you remember a while back when I was going over my layout with you, I got my tape here. I was talking about how you wanted to uh, stagger your seams and then also arrange it so you don't end up with slivers anywhere. And so an example of that, so here we've got our second layer of insulation that's gonna go down and this piece is actually gonna go, you know, and get in between the wheel wells. Well, you can see I've got one seam here, so this piece here is T-shaped and this piece here is T-shaped. That's really nice. Now, if you're not careful though, when you're making your layouts, you might end up with a piece that is T-shaped on one side and on the other, so it ends up being sort of H-shaped. And so maybe you only have like a little like three inch piece here and then like another three inch piece here and you have to cut out your wheel well around it. And it's gonna make a really weak piece of either wood or plot or um, insulation. So if you look here, my next piece, keep in mind these are 48 inches wide, so I'll be cutting out a notch there. And then look where that 48 ends. It ends right in line with my wheel well. And I did that because if I had started that second piece a little farther forward, you see if, my, if that piece ended there, I'd have like a little sliver right, right in this area that would just be kind of floating in space. And when you're working with this foam, it would just break. It would just flat out break. Another thing you wanna watch out for at this phase, you'll notice as we move up, our measurements change. So the next layer of foam is actually gonna come out to, it looks like just about 11 inches there. Whereas this piece, you know, it's on the nine inch mark. And then our subfloor, the actual uh, plywood that we go on top of that, that's probably gonna be closer to 12. So the, the width of these wheel wells, you know, it shrinks as you go up. I uh, just wanted to share that with you. So if you can plan ahead, when you start laying your floor in back there, That'll make sure that you don't end up with odd cuts and slivers around your wheel wells as well. It's a big pain in the butt and you definitely want to avoid it. day number three last day of the subfloor install and uh, everything's looking great I'm gonna pull you in and show you what's going on but our layers all laid flat overnight and the PL is cured up with 
you know, about 2,000 pounds of stuff on top. And uh, we're going to get this up. We've got a wood threshold that's going in up front here. And then um, I also have a little cutout that I'm making a framed opening for that goes around our fuel tank access panel. It's really important that you leave that panel accessible because that's how you get to the sender, which is in the fuel tank and um, relates the level of the fuel in a tank to the gauge up front. And it's also going to give us access so that later on when we add the diesel heater to this bus, we can tap right into the fuel tank there, which is absolutely the best way to go. No reason not to do it unless you accidentally build over that opening in the process of your conversion. But hopefully you're watching this before you install your subfloor. Let me show you what's going on bring in down here. Okay, so this is what we're going to be completing today. The last pieces of insulation. And we're going to be coming right up to this line here and taking that across. And that's just right in front of our stairwell. And so as you can see what I was talking about here, this is our access panel. That's the sender for the fuel tank. And um, I actually cut this piece of foam a little bit short so that I wouldn't have to make an awkward cutout and so that my frame, which I've got here, this guy, will just sit over that. So the frame is the same thickness as our insulation and I put an extra lip on it. I don't know, just because it seemed like the right thing to do. Um, this will go in place here. The subfloor will go on top of it. I'm gonna bring my subfloor up to about right here and leave a three quarter inch reveal. And that way my patch, the panel that will go over this will have a nice lip to rest upon. All right, so we've got the last of our foam in and everything's looking awesome. Um, I've got my threshold piece here made up and that's ready to go. And um, with this box, I want to show you what my plan is. So I'm going to go ahead and grab a tape and uh, I'm going to take my little lid here that I've made and get that on there nice, just like I want it. And then I'm going to grab a tape and I'm going to measure from there to this edge and there to this edge so I can index it uh, front to back. And then side to side, I'm going to measure from this edge to the side of the bus here. And I'm going to record those measurements on here, and then I'm not going to cut the opening yet on this top last layer of plywood. I'm actually going to glue the plywood down, and then I'm going to use those measurements to locate this back where I want it. And once I have this back where it should go, I'm going to trace around it on the new sheet of plywood. And then I'm going to set the depth on the bottom of my circular saw to three quarters of an inch, and I'm going to plunge cut the opening out. I find it's easier to cut to the size of your patch or your panel than it is to try to fit the panel to an opening, if that makes any sense at all. So I've got this ready to go. And then over here, I've got my sheet cut. Hey, look, a roof raise. <laughs> and I'm gonna go ahead and grab Ben. We'll glue this down. I'm gonna fill this gap here with glue press that up and then once the sheet is down, I'm going to screw into the top of it and I'll probably just put some sandbags or something to block this in or hold this up in place for now. Because eventually I'm going to have my one inch foam board down here in the driver's cockpit with my three quarter inch plywood on top of that and that'll capture it. But for now, I just need something to hold it in place. So I get you set up and watch that go down. Okie 
doke. So that just turned out fantastic. And the whole floor is done. It's glued in and laying flat. Tomorrow I'm gonna come in and I'll make that plunge cut for my fuel tank access. We'll get all these sandbags out of here and I'm gonna go ahead and paint the top of this floor just to seal it all up. And then our next project for a different time will be this front area. Looking great though. <sighs> well, the day is tomorrow and I've already broken a sweat because I was getting the sandbags, batteries and water jugs clamping this floor down out of here so I could cut my opening for my fuel tank access and we can throw a coat of primer on here to seal this floor up. And I'm gonna bring you in. I just wanna share with you how wonderfully this is all turning out. I'm just chuffed. Take a look. So here we are, all the bags removed and it's just flat as can be. And I can tell you, I'm in the middle of laying wood floors in my 1908 house and I would die to have floors this flat. Anyway, getting ready to cut that fuel tank access hole here. And like I said, I measured our distances off the wall there and into this seam. So I had eight and a quarter off the wall, four and a half off the seam, lined up those edges, and then I traced this whole thing. I'm gonna grab the uh, skill saw and I'm gonna set my depth of cut to this. I'm gonna make what's called a plunge cut and cut this out, finish the corners with my multi-tool and I can remove this and I'll already have my patch ready to go. Like I was saying, it's easier in my opinion to cut a hole to fit your patch than to cut a patch to fit the hole. I seen other folks doing this, you know, subfloor thing recently on YouTube and you, you gotta like, use the tongue and groove style plywood and minimize your number of seams. Oh my gosh, you want it flat. Gotta keep it flat. All right, let's make these cuts. Accidentally got a little glue. <laughs> anyway, nailed that opening though, huh? Pretty pleased with that. Now let's see if our patch fits. Oh, I hope it does. Oh boy, that's a that's a very snug fit, isn't it? I'm gonna trim that just as scotch, but please, please, please. <laughs> well, had to get the chisel out and pretend to be a carpenter to get the uh, PL off, but I think now, let's see what we got here. And once I push this down, I don't think it's going anywhere. Look at that, no lippage anywhere. Well, that's great. Anyway, let's clean up this mess and uh, we'll grab our paint, we'll sweep it out, seal this thing up. Well, another night has come and gone. The primer I laid down has had a chance to dry and things just keep getting better around here. I think this might be the nicest subfloor I've ever put down. So there's that. I picked a good time to do it. I hope you enjoyed watching this video and you got something out of it. I definitely learned a couple of things and had a good time sharing it with you. If you like this kind of content, make sure you like the video and subscribe and tune in every Sunday where I drop a new video and follow it up with a live chat. We'll answer all of your bus related and non bus related questions. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. Mm -hmm. level.
got our door made and our bus is finally, since the first time, well, who knows? <clears throat> Product showcase!